is a prelude in A minor by J.C. Bach, which is a series of broken chords. And when you see these broken chords, you know immediately that you would like to block them because that will give you a bigger grouping in terms of how you think about the piece rather than note to note. And in blocking, you're pulling in the harmonies and the harmonies have progressions that have surprises, unexpected events that you have to be made aware of. And that's where a foundational understanding of the theory of the piece is also part of the learning uh, paradigm. In the prelude in A minor, you know, the first section has so many common tones, we call it like a pedal point because the left hand has one note, but going through that one note are chords that are somewhat dissonant and others that blend into the bass of the left hand. Now the left hand is both really a bass, but it's also a continuation of, you could say, the melody going from left to right, but it does form an underlying fundamental bass below it. So I block out the beginning and I, I, the student starts to learn what the fundamental harmonies are. They have to know in A minor what every chord, go through the chords of A minor using G sharp because that will give us a dominant major chord, which is major in the minor key. Otherwise, we'll get more of a modal sound. We'll have a lowered G instead of G sharp. So they're good for them to do this first using the G sharp of the harmonic form as they go through the chords. And it happens to cause an augmented chord on a three. You might not see the augmented three chord here. We don't, but we do see a dominance with the G sharp. So once a student learns that in the first part is a series of A's, has to kind of learn what's happening in terms of chording the right hand, and they can actually add the A into the into the composite, so that it that it starts with the A minor, which would the A minor is soft, it says P, and then there's a crescendo across all the way to here, but if you block it, you don't experience what's going to happen when you go through the chord up as a crescendo and then down as a diminuendo. So that would be hard to do in a block sense in terms of dynamics, but you can go back to soft and then it's a crescendo. Here again, that starts to decay as soon as you play it. And that's what's going to happen when you actually unravel it because you want a diminuendo coming down. How do you do that? Let's say you have this chord that has an outer crescendo and then a diminuendo. Well, you would be deeper in the keys when you start it like this, and then lighter coming down and resolving. The same thing happens when you have measure four going through the tonic in minor. You have an outer crescendo and then a fade off, so you would maybe start deeper like this, and then lighter coming down. Some of them have that, and others are just played in a bigger crescendo over measures. So you, those are easier to simulate in blocks, because you know you're doing that. But here, you know that when you come down, you're going to come down softer. And that will start you again on the soft and then the deeper here again you're going to go up louder and come down softer and then totally disappear resolve now this is hard there because a lot of students will poke that five that last note is really wisping away and if you try to do use a finger attack or even a tiny finger squeeze chances are it's going to be poked out and not be what you want. That's where that motion of going forward like that, just a little bit of forward, plays that note for you. So it's a wonderful opportunity to exploit the use of the wrist to play the finger. Actually plays the finger. The finger's not playing. There's something behind the finger that's bigger than a tiny motion. And the most beautiful part of the prelude in A minor, actually, is a second half because the harmonic rhythm intensifies and there's a series of secondary dominants. That means the primary dominant of A minor happens to be E major and that we already experienced that in the first half, but it wasn't very interesting. But the second half starts playing dominance on different, in different places.
places, such as the dominant of E minor by way of B major is the dominant of E minor. And that's how he starts. So he's forte. And I'm making kind of a, a less on my resolution there, but not so much less because I've got a big series of number of chords over a large amount of measures. Now here, see, it's now falling down. I'm doing both hands. I like to activate both my hands. And then falling down. Now this is the one where there's going up a little deeper and less going down. Like that. And then we have that beginning coming back. Wrist forward. Oh. Um, so, so you have many measures in which you have secondary dominance. You can say sequences of secondary dominance. You've got to know what the secondary dominance are and what the tonics are. Or that is, what are they re resolving to? You have to know. And are they coming down in steps? So let's see what it is. So B major to E minor. A major was a step down from B major to D minor. So far there's a real sequence here. G major, we should go to C minor, but surprise, C major. It's a dominant, but we've programmed, I think we've heard, that it's been going major, minor, major, minor, so that's a surprise. And this is even more of a surprise. You hear that dissonance, you have a diminished. And now you can breathe a sigh of relief that you finally come back to pure dominant, home key, tonic, which is a sigh in my opinion. And then moving a little deeper, and then this is the one that deep and comes down softer, disappears. I always breathe in on notes like that that are so volatile and vulnerable to poke as I'm going forward with my wrist I do an inhale and it can't be forced it has to be breathing so naturally and so profoundly relaxed that when you get there there is an ability to ingest air instead of a choke up and again there's breathing involved here um, the other interesting thing is the left hand has a counter melody you know it, it's going across under one beam but we do hear a distinct lean, less, lean, that has a tenuta mark, less, lean, less, lean, less. The fingering is not sequential here. You have two twos instead of one, two, one, two. What you've had here is one, two, substitution, one, two, finger substitution, one, two, finger substitution, but suddenly no more finger substitution, another two, and then to a three. And then your crescendo, and you can block. So much blocking can be done in this. Uh, but I do know what the keys are. I know the secondary dominance, and I know the surprises where we're not going dominant tonic minor, dominant tonic minor, sometimes dominant major. And sometimes dominant and not really a dominant going to a diminished because this is a real surprise. But this is a relief. Oh, finally, we've gotten back home. So all that's important in, in, in playing the piece artistically. But you know, the groundwork, the groundwork is blocking. And and the other thing I work with a student with is not squeezing these chords out, but having this sort of quicksand and going through you know, a feeling of follow through, through something thick, so you don't uh, sound like you're playing on a, uh, a, a hard surface and getting a poke sound, because these are very voluptuous kinds of sonorities. They're absolutely gorgeous. Now, after you go through all of that mapping of how you're going to do it and where your surprises are, we, knew, we know the surprises are dominant to diminished chord. We think it's going to a tonic, it doesn't. Uh, where it's finally resolving home to the home key after all of these secondary effects um, that has to be felt, so the listener. Then we have to unravel the chords, and that's tricky because this mo there's a certain redundant motion, and the redundant motion seems to be this. Oh, Now, 
what's coming out is actually the fives. I'm going to just do it. So what's coming out is the melody. You can hear it. It's up on top. It's the highest note of that little rolled out chord. There's the melody. Itself, that rolling motion goes toward your fives. So you want to make sure you're rolling into your fives and bringing them out. And contour it just like you contoured the blocks that you did. And you got to know the theory of it, you got to know the surprises, the unexpected, and the motion therein, the, the threads through this. It's a wonderful piece for, for educating the student about a certain motion. Um, now this is the most gorgeous thing, as I said before, because now we don't have this pedal point. The pedal point is where there's one A and you have this some dissonant, some fitting in there. Fit in, fit in, don't fit in, don't fit in, fit in to that A. That's why it's like a pedal point, we call it. Now, over here we have um, to hear that left hand descending as a counter melody, counter melody. It's a counter melody, really. And so there's two things going on. There's, you want to hear? But really good if the student could actually sing through the texture and sing that counter line. That would be wonderful ear training. Um, and I, I encourage students to do that, to play one hand and sing the other. That truly means they've, they've, they've learned it and also they're learning to ear train. And they can also sing the top and it goes very high and I don't have a great voice. But the melody here is also rolling toward the five. So the, the melody would be, and I'm going to probably squeak, but it would be is isolate the fives against the counter melody. So you feel, this is the forte, so you get this. Watch. So you hear that. Breathing all the way. Most. what you want to hear cutting through those broken chords is the principal note, the, the contouring note, the, the line that you're thinking about. So there's so many stages and there's so many things you can do before you unravel everything. Mm -hmm.